and welcome to mini episode 19 of Real Life Ghost Stories. Oh, you do. I've got two listener episodes. Episodes? Wow, have you? Yeah, two whole episodes up wow. my sleeve. Wow. I have two you listener got sleeves. stories for you today. Are you ready for them? Well, I was thinking about this as we were going into recording it. And after last week's last story, no, I'm really not ready. I'd almost prefer we didn't do this. If that's okay. And uh, no, we're we're gonna do them. We're gonna do them. Okay. You're just gonna have to bite the bullet, babe, and just deal with it. I don't know if I can, to be honest. So we've got two stories today, and our first story comes from Adrian. My wife and I moved house in December 2013 from Leicester City to a South Leicestershire village. The house dates back to 1693 and is believed to be the first brick house built in Leicestershire. The attic, which is currently being converted, has been rumoured to have housed soldiers and airmen during war times, and the basement contains loads of original features, such as original rusty meat hooks hanging from the ceiling, a bread oven, a cheese press, etc. There's also what looks like a prison door down there onto a room that has been rumoured to have held prisoners until the law could come and take them away. A priest hole has also been mentioned, but we are yet to find it. So I'm going to pause there for a second because there's loads going on here that might not be just, common knowledge for some listeners. Okay, so the meat hooks thing took me yeah. by surprise a little bit because I was thinking, you know, like Saw or Dead by Daylight. Yeah. But actually... Yeah, it makes sense. You know, if you're talking about a big, a big house of servants, then it would be a kitchen and you need to hang your meat somewhere. So that's actually not as sinister as it sounds to people that maybe don't have an understanding of of older houses so a priest hole was i believe now correct me if i'm wrong where they used to hide priests during times of religious turmoil yeah which so like, was like every 20 years for a long period of english history. yeah so like in henry the eighth's time for example wasn't there loads of trouble about like catholic priests and they used to hide them and stuff so it priests... literally goes on from that point Right up until for about nearly 150, nearly 200 years after, it's backwards and forwards. One minute we're Catholic, one minute we're Protestant, one yeah. minute we're Catholic. And then with this, every time it's switched, the opposing religion, as it were, would be, what's the word, victimized or... Persecuted. Persecuted, that's the one. So priest holes were where they would literally hide priests in these times of persecution. Shortly after moving in, my wife and I were putting up pictures in one of the bedrooms upstairs. I grabbed the first nail and hammered it in. Bang, bang, bang. My wife passed me the next nail, and before I had the chance to hammer it in, clear as a bell, and an exact copy of my hammering, a loud bang, bang, bang. We both froze for a bit, and then started the usual swearing, and then my wife bravely went into the box room, which was on the opposite side of the wall, to check for some kind of explanation. It couldn't be explained, and we downed tools and left the pictures to another day. If it had been just me that had heard it, my wife would not have believed me. However, she was there and could not explain it, and is less likely to believe in this kind of thing. In 2015, we were expecting our first child, so we needed to renovate the box room. It literally had to be gutted back to the original lath. To save costs, I tore down the failing plaster, which was the original mud and horse hair that they'd used many years ago. Anyway, I found embedded in the wall a cloth ball which was filled with tangled up rope. It was a bit smaller than a tennis ball and was stitched shut with all the rope tangled inside. On the outside of the ball, there were lengths of cloth stitched to the ball about a fingering length. The cloth lengths were like cut off tea towel edges. It kind of resembled a spider, but with many legs all the way around. I threw it away with the rest of the waist, but cannot help wondering what the hell it could have been. Or was this linked to the knocking, as this was the bedroom that the knocks came from? I regularly have fires in the summertime in the back field to burn wasted wood, old fence posts, pallets, etc. 
A couple of years ago, I was very stupid and decided to use some petrol to get a struggling fire going. I poured a little on here and there and then got overconfident and proceeded to tip a load onto the fire. The fire went mental and the flames followed the petrol back to the can as I was holding and the explosion engulfed me. At the same time, or milliseconds after the explosion, there was a massive gust of wind that almost took me off my feet. It literally blew all the flames away from me, leaving me completely unharmed. This event gives me goosebumps, as I was completely engulfed in fire and all I could see was flames and I remember thinking, this is going to hurt and this is going to be really bad. The petrol can was completely blown to bits, only tiny melted fragments remained. All the grass around me had been burnt black and was still flaming in parts. The only grass that was still green was underneath my boots. I walked back to the house in silence, maybe in shock, and knocked on the door. My wife answered and knew something was wrong as I was as white as a sheet. I told her what had happened and she was right to call me an idiot. I think someone helped me that day. It wasn't even windy and I can't explain how I walked away unharmed. I was near to tears that evening and I'm eternally grateful for whatever happened that day. So can I start with the thing that he found in the walls? Yeah. It's like a witch's bottle. Ooh. It's quite a common thing. Well, common is kind of a loose term, a loose word to use, I think. But in England, people would hide witch's bottles in their chimneys. And I think they were bottles that were filled with something. So sometimes they were filled with like urine. It might be like horse hair. There'd be loads of other things that you'd hide in it. They were designed to ward off witches and you would put them in your chimney. So it's quite a regular thing to find witch bottles in England. And then there's a process to verify whether or not it's a a true witch bottle or whether it's something else. So that little ball of material sounds kind of like that same idea Mm. like why you'd have a rope in it i don't know Mm. there might be some folklore surrounding it though i mean old houses are fascinating right so it's always interesting to see what what's gone into the process of building it so we have that place where they found bodies in the wall (laughs) in canterbury don't we the tiny tea room yeah Yeah, tea room um and so there's, there's always that chance, I think, when you're renovating old houses in this country in particular, because they are so, a lot of them are so old. You don't know what you're going to find. No, it's, you don't. Whether, and if, you, if you're if you lucky enough to not find anything um, too freaky, you potentially might be unlucky enough to have um, realised that actually the house isn't as strong as it looks. Because yeah. <laughs> that's the other thing with restoring old houses, is that often you realise that actually... The things that are holding everything in place aren't as secure as they look until you start putting them apart and then you realise that actually you need a lot of work. Well, it was, you know, in the old house we used to live in, mm. the, the house that Dan and I lived in in the house share was a big, bizarre, rambling old house that had like seven floors because some of the floors were just a single room yeah. and these tiny pokey stairs and it was very strange. And what was beautiful about it was it had all the original wooden beams mm. But if you looked closely at the beams, you would see that most of the beam was eaten away with woodworm. Yep. So it was that kind of idea of, wow, this structurally looks beautiful. And then you look at it closely, it's like, this is about to fall down. Yeah. I mean, we, we our student house was, uh, when I was at university, was a, a really old grade two listed building and um, from like 16, one of the sort of early um, outer city houses. And it was just an amazing place to live in, but I would not have wanted to own it because just any little thing that went wrong really went wrong. <laughs> yeah, and often with houses like that, if something goes wrong, you need a specialist to be able to yeah. fix it. Yeah. So the second part of that story with the fire and the petrol can blows yeah. my mind. Yeah, because it always makes me think of two things. It makes me think of someone looking out for you, which is cool. And, you know, we've had conversations about that before, but it also makes me think that maybe we just haven't allotted time <laughs> to go. And when stuff like that happens to you that, could end you because it's not your time to go something intervenes yeah something intervenes it's just so weird to think that the whole ground was scorched around him except for the bit under his boots i mean he should have been burnt oh at at least like at least injured yeah 
100% at least injured. And definitely stupid. <laughs> yeah, but you've kind that of... That kind of thing you do. Yeah, we've all been there with fire where you've put something <laughs> yeah. into a fire that you shouldn't have and then you yeah. go, oh shit, yeah. that was a bad idea. Yeah, but yeah, it just makes me wonder, doesn't it? It just makes you wonder. And there's definitely some kind of intervention there because he would he, something should have happened to him. You don't, even on a windy day. You don't unlikely. walk away no. from something like no. that, especially when you are physically holding the petrol can. Yeah. And I think everybody has seen that happen where the flames jump into whatever the vessel is that that's flammable. And they jump out of it as well. Yeah. <laughs> they don't just go inside, blow up, but no, don't go anywhere else. Like, if you've got clothes on, if you've got skin, it's hot. It's just <laughs> it's mad. It's hot enough to explode, therefore it's going to cause some kind of damage. Even, like, to his hands. Yeah. Like, why were his hands not burned? Yeah. I just, that's so weird. Mm. So weird. I bet his wife was raging. Especially when she didn't see him being saved. Do you know, if yeah. you saw him being saved, you'd kind of, you might leave the rage yeah. behind. But if you he comes back and he's like, well, I had the petrol can of <laughs> Are you ready for story number two? I mean, I'm a little bit more settled off that one because it had quite a nice sort of twist to it. But um, I'm still struggling from last week, to be honest. Story number two comes from Claire. I've always been sensitive to the paranormal but I never truly admitted it until I was 15. I remember as a child never really feeling alone, even though I was an only child until I was 10, when my mother remarried and we moved out of my grandparents' house. We lived with my grandparents since I was a baby, and that was the first home I ever knew. My grandmother became my second mom, and my grandfather was like the dad I never had. Everyone thought my grandfather was a harsh man, he was a World War I vet and he never sugarcoated anything. I know my mom doesn't have very good memories of him and neither do her siblings or my older cousins, but he and I just clicked. I don't ever have a bad memory of my grandfather other than I knew not to make him mad, just like a child knows not to make their parents upset. I just want to make sure that you understand the relationship I have with my grandparents as it plays a part in my story. My grandparents were wonderful people. They used to pick me up every day after grade school and they would always have a snack waiting at home for me to munch on while I started my homework waiting for my mum to come home or after we moved out while I waited for my mum to pick me up from their house and for us to go back to our new home with my stepdad. After I was done with homework I would listen to my grandfather read poems while we just passed the time and this is how most of my childhood went up until I was in middle school. My grandfather fell ill and became bedridden. Those last few years, I remember walking to my grandparents' house after school because neither one could drive anymore and I wanted to spend more time with my friends. I started to spend more time with my friends and less time with my grandparents. In a way, I feel like I was starting to reject them. I became involved in some after-school activities my sophomore year of high school So again, I spent even less time with them. Meanwhile, both my grandmother had fallen ill and my grandfather only had months left, according to doctors. Now here is where the paranormal kicks in. I remember that night so vividly, just thinking about it to this day, fills me with so much emotion that I can't help but cry. I had a performance at school one evening and my mom had informed me I would have to miss it that the doctors told my family things weren't looking good and we should all prepare for the worst. I told my mom that the performance was too important for me and if something terrible happened, to just come and pick me up early or something. I made it to the end of the performance with no call from my mom. She was outside in the school parking lot waiting to take me home. As we drove home, the youngest of my two baby sisters was screaming her head off which at the time I thought was a normal toddler thing to do. At this point in my timeline, I am 15. One sister is five and the other is three. We get home and I remember my mother being exhausted due to the uneasy feeling I had. I decided to sleep in my mom's bed with her and the two little ones to try and help her out since my dad was working late. The whole time we were trying to get to sleep, the three-year-old is just sobbing to the point where she is gasping for air. And then suddenly she stops. We look at her to make sure she is okay. And as we do, she sits up, 
put her arms out as if she's hugging someone, says, Good night, Grandpa, and lays back down and goes to sleep as if nothing was wrong. Not even five minutes later, my mom receives a call from my uncle to say that my grandfather has passed away. I can't fully explain the feeling I had, but after that, I knew my other experiences weren't just coincidences or funny feelings. Mm. My heart. Yeah. It's, it's warming. No, that's not the right word, is it? Talk no, it, it. I know what you mean. Yeah. It's and just... I think there are so many stories of children in particular being visited by loved ones just at the point of death or yeah. who have just died. Like I, this is something that I fully believe. And yeah. I, it's not me saying it's paranormal. Like there's so much about the brain and the soul mm. and the mind that we don't know that maybe these children are more aware of a connection with other people. I don't know, but I think it's quite, I, have, I just think it's lovely. Maybe there's something to the person being in the, in the fight or the person that's dying, realizing that they're dying and then, their thoughts going to not being able to see so so many people grow up or something like that and then maybe it's part of a transference of that energy maybe um so if you know he's got a number of grandchildren but maybe that one is one of the youngest and your thoughts are like oh no you know i'm not I'm not going to get to see that person grow to be grown yeah and maybe that's you know maybe it's a sort of a transference of that sort of regret or something like that or maybe he just Maybe that it's part of being or wanting to visit that family and realizing that that we say this all the time that the younger children are more open to things because they don't understand they don't have that thing that adults or, or older children have, and they don't have that need to rationalize. No, and so maybe it's a case of actually he was there with that family in his last moments spiritually, and but. And the little one was the disturbed one that needed calming down, but was also the one that could recognise him, and therefore he did a final, to almost had a final act with that with that family. I just think it's lovely. Yeah. I just think it's so nice. Absolutely. So if you enjoyed this week's episode, you can find us on Instagram. I'm on Instagram at Real Life Ghost Stories. Dan is on Instagram at Fifty P Movie Club. You can find us on Twitter. At Real Ghost Pod. You can find us on Facebook, Real Life Ghost Stories Podcast. Give the page a like. Join the supergroup, which is RLGS Supergroup. And the question is... No, the answer is... The answer is... <laughs> Emma and Dan. You can send in your own stories to Real Life Ghost Stories Podcast at gmail.com. And you can support us on Patreon for either $5 a month or $2 a month for heaps of extra content. There is also a YouTube channel, which the link to is in the description of this episode. And there is a link to some merch too. And on that note, we shall see you next week. Bye.